Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I have um, just started the recording of our session. And I uh, hope all of you are doing good. Uh, thank you for connecting to the class today. Uh, we're going to take a moment to pray, and then we will get started. Um, all right, Salome. Would you like to pray, Salome, um, if it's OK? Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that I've done, Father God. Thank you for this day, Father, like for this new day that you added in our lives, Father God. Thank you, God, for the, everyone that is your Father. God, we give you glory, honor, and praise, Father. God, I pray, Father, that you, that you have sent Pastor in our lives, Father, that he could teach us this morning, Father. Thank you, God. God, you bless him, Lord God. You lead him while he speaks, Father. Thank you for all that I've done. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everyone. So, we are in our course on uh, Christian apologetics. We have um, spent quite a few lectures on um, talking about uh, creation, God, the existence of God, creation, and uh, you know different aspects, facets around uh, creation. Today we are going to change uh, uh, the, the focus, the theme, uh, look at another area where uh, people ask questions, and uh, which for us uh, we need to be able to you know provide answers. Uh, as far as uh, 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 in, in, in response to the questions that people ask. So we're going to talk about the accuracy and the authenticity of the Bible, the accuracy and authenticity of the Bible. How do you know that, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible that we are reading, uh, the text, so the content, the text is uh, accurate? It's correct. How do we know that, and and and, and how you know on what basis can we respond, and uh, and what would we say in response when somebody says, "Hey, you know, you're reading all of you're reading a Bible, uh, but how do you know uh, it is accurate? It's correct, right? Uh, how do you know uh, that the text has not been changed by somebody along the way?" So that's one part of the question we're going to answer. Uh, and then uh, we also want to understand. So, you know, what what would we say in response to that question? So then, in uh, in relation or in on the same subject, there would be other questions like, so, how did how was the Bible compiled? So, you know, we we say, okay, this is the Bible. Uh, it has sixty six books. Uh, well, uh, how was it compiled? Okay, how did you get it? First of all, uh, how do you know that? the text is accurate, the text is dependable? That's the first question. The second question is, how was this book compiled? And why do you say that, uh, on what basis do you say that uh, these 66 books, as you have in this in the Bible, uh, is, uh, is the word of God? Why not? You know, there are a lot of other things that were written around those times. Why not? Why weren't they added to the, to the Bible? So. That's the second question we want to answer, which probably, you know, uh, uh, so, okay, that's the second question. The third question is also a common question that people ask is, uh, why do you Christians have so many different versions of the Bible? I mean, you know, uh, doesn't that adulterate the original text? If you have so many different versions, which one is correct? And, uh, you know, and then, honestly, if you put several versions side by side, and people can do that, they can put you know three versions side by side, and uh, the same scripture uh, uh, in the three versions may come out with a different meaning. So that's really confusing. So that's the third question: is uh, what's going on here? You know, you're you, you, you're saying you're reading the same text. But you've got three versions of the English Bible. The same verse uh, in three versions is coming up with some different meaning. Uh, so that's a tough question. How do we respond to that? Right. 
So that's our objective in this uh, topic on the accuracy and the authenticity of the scriptures. So we will cover the first question today. Hopefully we'll cover that. Next week we will cover the other two. And I will try, I'll try to keep this as quick as possible, uh, as concise as possible. So within two weeks we will uh, cover this, okay? So uh, that's our uh, objective in, in talking about the accuracy and authenticity of the scriptures. Now, now all of us, uh, you know, we know uh, how value, how precious the word of God is to us, right? Uh, we know the power of the word of God in our personal lives. Uh, we have been greatly enriched as we personally have read the word, but it's not like that for everybody. Meaning th there are people who have questions. There are people who question whether this book that you and I, you know, we treasure, uh, where did it come from? How do you know it's reliable? Uh, and all those related questions. So even though we personally are convinced about the word of God and we personally are, you know, we treasure the word, we can't express that emotion to somebody else as an answer. You know, I can't go tell somebody, hey, I love my Bible, that's why it's true. That's not a valid answer. I mean, for that, for that person, right? I love the word of God, I treasure it, true. It's wonderful. Now, I can use my personal transformation to authenticate the working of the Bible. Meaning I can say, hey, this Bible has changed my life. I can use that. But it has to come after I, I convincingly answer these first three questions. Right? Because nobody's going to, you know, uh, people will appreciate that the Bible has transformed your life. Uh, that is that is wonderful. But they will still ask these first three questions. How do you know the text is reliable and accurate? Why 66 books? Why these 66 books? Yeah, on, on what basis were they put together? Why not? a 67th book or a 68th book from that same time period? And the third question is about these versions. Why are these so many versions? And some of these versions are the meaning of the text also changes. So those are very legitimate questions which we need to provide answers. And in addition to providing those answers, if we say, look, this Bible has changed my life, Okay, now people are going to really accept the Bible because not only have we answered uh, in a very uh, in, a, in a very practical way those first three questions in a very convincing way, but then we have also given the testimony of our personal transformation. Okay, so the testimony of uh, uh, God's word trans transforming you or impacting you is valid. Uh, it's it's important, but uh, in many cases, people may not accept that alone uh, as a sufficient answer, because they want they are asking these three legitimate questions about the Bible, and we need to answer that. Okay, so that's the journey we're going to make. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the PDF uh, that I've put out for today's lectures, and I'll put out another one for next week. Uh, for us to talk about this. So, uh, lesson number nine, the authenticity and the accuracy of the Bible. All right, uh, everyone's with me so far? What we're, let me just pause and get back here. Uh, everyone's with me, you, you know what we're going to look at in this section, any, any questions before we get started? Okay, you're all good. All right, fine. So let's go ahead and uh, get started with this with this lesson. Uh, I'll just go and share the PDF. All right. So you know, uh, over the centuries, people have made great attempts to destroy the Bible. And it's very interesting. You look back in the history. 
uh, as early as 380, the fourth century, the Roman emperor made a great attempt to eliminate, just get rid of the scriptures. So can you imagine, he ordered churches to be burnt, Christians to be killed, and all scriptures to be burnt. Like, let's get rid of this book. But today, the Bible still stands as the most circulated, the most widely read book in the whole world, in the history of the world, right? It's been translated into more languages and it's more accessible uh, than any. But there was an attempt, attempts were made. Walter uh, supposedly said that, you know, uh, within a hundred years, he said Christianity would disappear, the Bible would disappear, and people would not remember uh, anything. And very interestingly, and uh, now uh, 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 after his death, uh, it is said that uh, the Geneva Bible Society bought his house and used his house for printing Bibles. So he disappeared, his influence diminished practically, but the Bible continued, right? And so uh, here's a very interesting quote from Mare Tori. It says, for 18 centuries, every engine of destruction that human science, philosophy, wit, reasoning, and brutality could bear against this book has been brought to bear against it to stamp it out of the world. But it has a mightier hold on the world today than ever before. If that were a man's book, it would, it would have been annihilated and forgotten hundreds of years ago. So the very fact that the Bible not only has survived every effort to eliminate it, but instead it has just, just you know, proliferated all over the world in so many languages is, is a big testimony uh, to the hand of God, God in it, right? It's a big testimony. Now, very just quickly, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because uh, we are already familiar with this part of it, that, you know, the Bible uh, 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 was, it makes this claim, right? Uh, Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17. Can somebody read that for us, please? Uh, Uh, it's on the in the PDF itself. Somebody can read it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thank you. So what is the Bible? Of course, Paul is writing this. And what's he saying about the scriptures? He's saying, all scripture. So remember, Paul is writing this somewhere around uh, 60 AD, more likely 68 AD. This is his last episode that he wrote, Second Timothy. So it was probably 68 AD. And uh, he's saying all scripture. So for, in, for, for in, in Paul's mind at that time, it's all of the Old Testament scriptures. That means all the Old Testament that we have here. He's, that's what he's referring to. Plus, of course, his own writings. By the time uh, Paul is writing Second Timothy, uh, it's his last episode. So he's already written, you know, all the preceding episodes. And in his mind, he is referring to all of the Old Testament scripture too. Right? So this is all scripture. All of this written scripture, he says, is given by inspiration of God. So man wrote it. Man wrote it in the language of his time. I mean, people wrote it in the language of their time and day and time. Uh, they used uh, the grammar, the syntax, the figures of speech, and they used the culture, all of that. So it was, it was very human in that nature because people wrote it. But the inspiration was from God. 
So what we are saying is, yeah, 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 the, the text here is very human because people wrote it. They used the language, they used the grammar, they used, you know, figures of speech, they used the language of their day and time, but the inspiration is God. Right? And uh, Peter himself, so this is the another apostle, Peter, another apostle, Peter, 2 Peter 1, 2021, he says, uh, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. That means, uh, so first of all, he's referring to scripture as a, as a prophetic book, meaning uh, an inspire, inspirational, inspired book. So no inspired inspiration of scripture, prophecy of scripture. Is of any private interpretation. That means, you know, it wasn't some individual who sat down and wrote these things. So, you know, uh, people who question the Bible question, hey, uh, what if the, the scripture was, you know, some two or three people sitting together and putting it to, you know, private interpretation. They, they are making it up. But he says, hey, no prophecy of scriptures of a private interpretation, but for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So this is what we believe. This is what the Bible claims for itself. It's inspired by God. Through human agency, they were holy, but they were men of God. They were people of God. Right? So it was inspired, but man was involved in its writing, in its compiling, uh, in its preserving, in its transmission. So man was involved. So there is the divine aspect as a human aspect. So how did it all come together, right? How did this come? So some general information, uh, we know the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament was written over, come, uh, written over a thousand year period, uh, written both in Hebrew and Aramaic. And uh, uh, so portions of the Bible. Daniel Ezra was in Aramaic, uh, over a, written over a thousand year period. The New Testament was written over a 45 year period from about 50 AD to 95 AD. So together, uh, you go from uh, about a 1,500 year period, approximately. There are 66 books, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, totally 40 different authors, and uh, many of them never met each other. Right? So we have all of them writing, 40 different people uh, who have written these 66 uh, books. How has it been transmitted to us? Right. So in the early days, uh, it was written on papyrus. So papyrus is just basically uh, the stem of a plant uh, found around that region around uh, in Egypt, around the river Nile. And so they had this uh, stem of this plant. They made this into papyrus and they wrote on it. And later on, they moved to leather, leather scrolls on which this was written. And subsequently, so uh, papyrus would be this, you know, long continuous piece of paper or the scroll would be a long continuous uh, rollable scroll. Later on, they put it into what you know we would call as pages. So, uh, and that 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 book that's put together is called a codex, right? So, uh, so that's how it. That's the the material things that were they used uh, to write upon in the early days. So, the text of the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, was written on these kinds of materials. Uh, but it was written by a set of people called the scribes. And these were not ordinary people, but they were people who were uh, specialized or specifically trained to do this type of writing. So that means they were very meticulous in their job. 
very meticulous in the writing. Okay, what did that person say? I'm writing and I'm making copies of what is written. So they're met very meticulous in, in uh, how they wrote things to the point that, you know, uh, these scribes, uh, when they made copies of scrolls, uh, if there were errors, they destroyed the whole scroll. So it wasn't, uh, it, it, let, let me put it in a positive way, it was so meticulous that it was, the attempt was to be accurate. Right? So uh, they made copies, of course, everything was done by hand. They had to sit and write everything by hand uh, on these scrolls and make copies of it. And then, you know, as, uh, as they had these copies, of course, as people dispersed, as people were scattered through the Middle East and around the Mediterranean, uh, more and more copies were made and, you know, it covered that area. The text, the copies of these books uh, were, uh, wherever the people dispersed, they carried copies with them. And we refer to them as manuscripts. So, and that process continued. So people continue to make handwritten copies of these manuscripts over in that geographical area around the Middle East in the Mediterranean, uh, the scriptures were distributed. So now I want us to understand uh, uh, something that is simple to understand, but it is the basis of establishing credibility of ancient manuscripts. And this is what is done with all forms of literary work. So it's not specific to the Bible. All forms of um, uh, literary work, all manuscripts are evaluated on the basis of these two things. Right? So uh, the number of manuscripts in the time gap, okay, let me just go back to one more point here, that you know, uh, by usually, usually by is examining the style of writing, they would date the uh, the manuscript, right? So there are experts, uh, papyrologists, who can determine to a good estimate. Uh, I mean, of course, these are estimates; they're not accurate. But, uh, they can estimate the age of. Uh, uh, manuscript by looking at the style. So there are experts who do that, so we will leave it to them. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, they could be even the uh, dating process, but typically the handwriting is, is a key. All right, so going back to this, how do we determine the authenticity of a manuscript, the credibility of a manuscript, right? Two things, uh, and this applies, as I was saying, across the board to all ancient manuscripts. One is the number of manuscripts, right? So the more manuscripts you have, uh, the more it adds to the credibility of the text. And of course, you know, you're going to also look at the consistency in the text, right? Uh, there is human error, you know, there could be a comma missing or, a, you know, the small variations would be there, of course, in copying. Um, but the fact that you have more number of manuscripts with the same text is one factor that establishes the authenticity and the credibility of the text. The other thing that... Uh, is looked at is the time gap. That means what is the oldest manuscript available? And what is the time between the oldest manuscript available to the time when things actually happened? So that's a time gap. Or when the person who spoke those words existed, lived, right? So time gap. So the smaller the time gap, uh, the more closer to the original we are likely to be. That means uh, less uh, transmission error in copying and so on. So the le closer we are, the smaller the time gap, the more closer we are to the original. 
So it's on this, this basis that uh, the validity of manuscripts, the authenticity and the accuracy of manuscripts are established, right? So you look at some of the ancient uh, manuscripts from different you know, philosophers and historical works, and uh, here's the other numbers that we see, right? So Plato, uh, who lived a, a few hundred years before Christ, uh, what, how many manuscripts do we have? About 200 manuscripts of his works. And uh, about a time gap of 1,300 approximately, again, of uh, 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 from the time he lived to the oldest that we have. Sorry, sorry. Uh, another Greek historian, we have only eight manuscripts, time gaps of 1,300 years. It doesn't, now when we say time gap, it does not mean there were no earlier manuscripts. Obviously there were, there must have been many early manuscripts prior to that, but the oldest that we have available is 1,300 years from when he or Plato or uh, uh, he existed. Uh, which means that the earlier manuscripts were destroyed or lost along the way and over time. Okay. So you look at several other philosophers. We have 8,300. Uh, we have the Roman history, uh, 35 of the 140 volumes out of 20 manuscripts around 480, 10 manuscripts, 900 years, uh, and so on. You know, and then you can look at this and uh, I, I'm just showing this here to show us that, you know, the numbers, you look at the numbers, you know, how many manuscripts do we have? What is the time gap? Compare it, right? Uh, even of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's plays, uh, uh, we have a, a large portion of what, what he had written. Uh, there are disputes on changes to that book could have been made to his place. Now, when you come to the Bible, uh, let's understand this. So, up until 1948 or so, the last book of the Bible, Malachi, was around 400 BC, similar to what we saw with Plato and so on. Some of the Greek philosophers. So around 400 BC, the last book. And uh, around 200 BC, uh, we also had the Old Testament translated from Hebrew to Greek, the Septuagint, around 200 BC. And up till about 1948, that means, uh, you know, when the King James was translated, which was King James was translated around 16 uh, something. Um, uh, there was this huge time gap that we actually had, about a 1,300 year time gap, because the oldest manuscripts was from 980 of the Old Testament scriptures. So the oldest manuscripts was from 980. Uh, the, the last book was around 400 BC, so we're having a time gap of about 1,300 years. This was still about 1940. But then what happened? And, and of course, all of this was kept for us in Ezra. And if we read about Ezra in the Old Testament, he was, a, you know, we think of Ezra as, um, as a priest and who helped with the rebuilding of the temple and so on. But uh, more importantly, his role and the role of the scholars in those times, the scribes in those times, was in preserving the scriptures. Right, so they really played a great role in preserving the Old Testament scriptures. Now, what happened? Very, so remember, we had about a 1,300 year time gap till about 1940. So, all the translations of the Bible till the 1940s were based on text that was from 980 or thereabouts, which means there was this huge time gap. But then what happened in 1947, 
is there was this amazing discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So what actually happened was uh, uh, there was uh, a shepherd and uh, some of the sheep wandered off. And so this, he went looking for, not sheep, his goats, I guess, his goats in the Qumran caves near the Dead Sea. So as he followed, uh, went looking for his lost goat or goats, um, he ended up in these caves, the Qumran caves near the Dead Sea. And in these caves, he found a huge collection or repository of clay jars, uh, about two feet high, 10 inches wide. And inside these jars were leather scrolls preserved. And uh, so you're talking about somewhere here in the Qumran caves on the Dead Sea. And this was in 1947, so it's pretty recent. And uh, so they got these scrolls right here from these caves. And what did they find? They found every book of the Old Testament, except for the book of Esther. Sorry, Esther. But all the books of the Old Testament. And these were from 70 AD, or actually even before 70 AD. So somehow, these uh, scribes who lived at that time had put all of these scrolls here, hidden all these scrolls here in the caves to preserve them. And uh, so they got these scrolls that went back to the first and the century, first and second century BC. So that means around 100, 200 BC. Okay. So, so now what's happening? Your time gap has gone from 1,300 years to about 200 years, approximately, roughly. Now that's amazing. That means you've you've got manuscripts or scrolls, manuscripts that are so close to the earliest you know times and when things were written or things were spoken. You, you, as close, I mean, you, 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 this is really close. And what was interesting was, so remember we had manuscripts from 980. And now you are finding manuscripts from approximately 200 BC. What was interesting was the text in these manuscripts were essentially unchanged. And um, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, unchanged for more than 2,000 years. So these are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, these are the the, the clay jars and the Qumran caves that were discovered. So, you know, uh, they have found about 800 uh, scrolls. And so the scrolls had a lot of things, but 230 of them were the, of the scriptures. Uh, every, Bible, every book of the Old Testament, except for Esther, in these caves, like we mentioned, right? So we just, uh, okay, I kind of jumped ahead, my, ahead of myself, but here's what we see here. Okay. We had Isaiah, which was written around 750. Okay, let me pause and ask if people are with me or gone to sleep. Um, okay. Um, all right. Okay, sorry. I'm just looking at uh, the comments here. Everyone's... Okay, Taisha's in. All right, I don't know. Okay. Okay, um, I hope uh, all of you are with me. Yeah, I was just talking. I wasn't, uh, I was looking at the PDFs. I wasn't seeing the chat. You all good so far? Okay. All right. Uh, now, I'm sorry if people were 
out of the classroom because uh, once I start and I move to the PDF, um, students are not let in. I'm really sorry for that. Hope they got in. Okay, anyway. All right, uh, somebody can inform Taisha to come into the class. Okay. All right, Charles, uh, uh, why are the works of William Shakespeare connected to the Bible writing? They're not connected, Charles. I was uh, just giving a list of, uh, uh, so th there's no connection. Uh, we're just giving a list of different works of people, starting from, you know, uh, philosophers from, the Greek philosophers from about 308 BC. Uh, what we were, we were just giving an example of, you know, here are all the, their works, and uh, this is the number of manuscripts we have. This is the time gap that exists for their works. Okay, so we were just kind of giving an example, and then we just picked up Shakespeare. We just mentioned that even in Shakespeare's works, which, you know, is widely read and taught in schools and all of that, uh, there is a lot of questionable text, you know, in his works, but no, nobody, you know, deals with that when they read Shakespeare. But the fact is that even in Shakespeare's works, there are multiple copies of some of his plays with variations in it. So that's all I wanted to uh, mention. Okay, so it, it has nothing to do with the Bible, just, just a thing. Is that okay, Charles? Okay. Fine, so uh, thank you, all right. So you all with me so far, okay? Let's go back. So I'm going to go back to the PDF. So here's the amazing thing that we found, right? From the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this was found in 1947. Uh, we've got all of the Old Testament except for the Book of Esther. And now we are comparing uh, so remember the oldest manuscript that we had up until that time was from 980. Now, now we are find, we have obtained manuscripts from about uh, you know 150 BC. This period, right? We've got uh, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls. These were the manuscripts that were found in 1947 from about 150 BC, and we know that the book of Malachi now. So this reduces the time gap between the oldest, the last book of the Bible to about 250 years. Now, very interesting. The book of Isaiah was written 750 BC approximately. Isaiah lived and spoke around that time. So it was written around 750 BC. Initially, the oldest copy we had was from 980. The, we then found a copy of Isaiah that came from 150 BC. That's almost 1,000 years, approximately 1,000 year difference. And what did we find? We found that the copy of Isaiah that we had in 980, from 980, was, uh, I'm using the word exact, or can you be, you could say in complete agreement, was exactly the same as a copy of the book of Isaiah from 150 BC, that is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that means a, over a thousand year period of manual transmission, so think about it. You know, we are talking about scribes sitting and copying. People copying, copying, copying. Over a thousand year period, there was no error. So just giving an example of one book, there's no error. And therefore, and now this brings us a little closer to, you know, uh, about a 600 year gap between when Isaiah was written to the earliest scroll that we have. So therefore, we can have great confidence that this manual transmission process over a thousand year period, like we said, you know, they had to sit down and copy it on papyrus and then um, they, 
used leather scrolls, and then they formed these books called Codex. That though it was manually done, it was done to the highest possible accuracy. Right. So when we compare, and so that table that was shown earlier was just for comparison. So when we compare ancient scriptures or ancient texts or ancient manuscripts that are in existence, what can we say about the Bible? We can say, and, I, and I'll give you the numbers just uh, if it's coming up on the next page. Um, the Bible has more manuscript evidence supporting its reliability and accuracy of translation. Now, and this is one example. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a powerful example. It has, more, uh, it has more supporting evidence of reliability and accuracy than all other ancient texts. And uh, we will look at the New Testament. We've just mentioned we're old. I will, we will talk about the New Testament coming up shortly. But the New Testament manuscripts, you know, now the New Testament manuscripts comes from the time of most of these Greek philosophers that people today quote so proudly, oh no, Plato said this and so and so said this, Socrates said this, and you know, they quote so proudly. And they don't realize that, hey, Plato's manuscripts have a thousand year, 300 time, 1,300 year time gap. And he's got just about eight manuscripts of what he's supposed to have said. And they don't realize the New Testament, which you know just came 300 years after, has more number of manuscripts and they are closer to the original time. That means from that time, we have those manuscripts. So even if you compare, uh, if you, you know, the New Testament manuscripts with manuscripts of philosophers who existed or who lived around or in the proximity of that time, the New Testament manuscripts far supersede both in number and time gap, in number and proximity than any of those philosophers that people today, you know, talk about. So if, you, if they're going to question the New Testament, then you definitely have to question all the philosophers and historians of their days, because there's a huge dis discrepancy, a huge gap, a di difference in manuscripts and time gap of ancient texts. Right. And we've already shown about the Old Testament, how amazing the accuracy is. I mean, this is astounding that the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was from 150 BC to the scrolls that we had prior, 980, that there is no variation in the text over a thousand year period. And that's why, you know, all the translations that were done, you know, uh, before that time are accurate and reliable. So, you know, we had uh, uh, the most common, which was the King James version uh, in 16, uh, 1611, based out, out of these uh, manuscripts from 980, we can be absolutely confident that, hey, this is, this is, uh, this English translation is close or is accurate to the original text because we see hardly any change over a thousand year period. So we can rest assured, uh, rest confident in the reliability and the accuracy of the text that was translated for us. Even though the manuscripts were from 980. So this is an amazing discovery and you know, it's, it's almost like God saying, okay, hello, I want to tell you, I'm behind all of this. And why did, you know, why was it that um, uh, this discovery was made in 1947 uh, by a shepherd boy looking for his lost goat? Uh, I think God is smiling and saying, I just want to show you all something. You know, 
I don't think this this discovery happened by accident. Uh, you know, the Bible had by this time, by 1947, uh, the word of God had been translated and, uh, you know, people were preaching, teaching. And then when you made this discovery, it's like it really just, you know, it's like God's stamp saying, look, the scriptures that you have is accurate and it outshines all other ancient manuscripts. You know, so I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, it's just, just amazing. I'm amazed at uh, the, the, the whole, you know, what happened there in the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, how it was discovered and how it really added credibility to uh, the Old Testament scriptures, the accuracy of the Old Testament scriptures and how, you know, it, it, it really strengthened our, our faith or our conviction in the reliability of the text. God just timed it and God made it available for all of us. And it's just uh, amazing. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here. We are going to pick up from here after the break. Uh, we look at some more numbers just to say that, look, Old Testament has so many manuscripts. The New Testament has so many manuscripts, uh, all of those kinds of things, okay? Uh, we'll come back after the break and uh, go through that. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, let me see now. There are some questions here. How did they establish oldest known Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament? Were... Okay. Yeah, so... Christopher, the predominantly two ways. One is the, uh, like we said, the papyrologists do it through the handwriting process. And then of course we have the dating process through radioactive dating to, to, you know, to whatever extent that, that helps us. But these are the two ways we uh, see. Uh, in the case of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because we know who did it, who preserved it, the uh, SNEs, the, the the scribes who did it, were called the SNEs. We know when they lived, and when they did the copying. So that establishes, really establishes, uh, the time of those scrolls, right? The because we know the scribes or, or the, the 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 scribes who did the copying of those scrolls. So it establishes. So you know we would do this by these three aspects. We can establish the uh, date of those Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? Okay, Max, and is any philosophy, if I only look, only the book has still not found on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hmm. Um, interesting. I don't have an answer to that question, uh, Max, and, uh, 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 why the Book of Esther was not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, no. Sorry. I, maybe we should research on that. I, I didn't think of it, but it's a valid question. And um, yeah, we need to do a little research on, on that, but I, 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 I don't know whether we can find answers to why uh, Esther, the book of Esther, was not there. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Okay, maybe you should research on it. Okay, Samuel, the book of Isaiah, it's the oldest manuscript we have. Shouldn't the book of Moses be the oldest manuscript? Yeah, so we do have, so all the, remember, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, right, uh, all the books of the Old Testament, except for Esther, were found. So we found the first five books of Moses, and we found the book of Job, and all the Old Testament books from, as copied by those scribes from that time, about 150 BC, uh, the SMEs were, were found. Uh, but we're just doing a comparison of Isaiah uh, and uh, to see the accuracy of it. Um, so I'm not sure 
your question, Samuel? Uh, okay, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to take a little break. Uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Uh, I just want to apologize uh, for those of you who were locked out. Daesh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were outside the class. And anyone else who was outside the class, uh, I started and I kind of moved to looking at the PDF. So I wasn't aware. I uh, apologize for that. But hopefully you can uh, watch the video and uh, catch up with the parts that uh, you missed. All right, so let's uh, come back in a few, maybe 10 minutes quickly, and we will continue from where we paused, okay? Uh, I hope you're all with me. It's not getting too technical. Uh, you, you've understood the two issues on number of manuscripts and the time gap. Is that very clear? Uh, any questions on that? Do you understand the time, time gap uh, aspect? Yeah. Okay. I'm assuming all of you have understood it. Any questions you can ask. I'll be back right after the break. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> 